to discuss uh, one of the important topics and uh, we have cyber security leaders from a very diverse background and uh, it will be good to hear how they take the role of a CISO and uh, so without uh, taking much of the time let us move ahead and uh, start with our first point of discussion so the first point uh, which we'll be discussing is about uh, what are the top challenges as a CISO you are facing. We'll start with uh, Abdul Rahman and uh, he can enlighten us on this point. Yes, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Atif. Thank you, Ahmad. Thank you, the Jeddah Besides team for having all of us on this panel discussion. Uh, regarding your question, from my experience, uh, the fairest big uh, challenge is the cybersecurity skills shortage. It's very difficult nowadays to recruit uh, quality talent, especially the senior level of them, as well as training and returning them to stay with us in the organization. So this is the fairest uh, uh, challenge for me. The next one is user awareness and training. We all know that human is the weakest link. Phishing, pretexting, attacks still occur every day, and people seem to still click on malicious links, download malicious files. Uh, we need to invest in training people to make them security aware and uh, to be the first line of defense in the organization. The third challenge is the compliance and regulation requirements. It may seem an uh, easy challenge, but sometimes it's difficult, especially if you are uh, complying, uh, you are required to comply with more than one regulation, like the NCA in Saudi Arabia, the BCI, the SS, the NEST, and the ISO, etc. Of course, there is uh, a lot of overlapping between all of these, but still it is a challenge. That's number three. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Abdul Rahman. Uh, let us have a quick overview also from uh, Brian. He already gave a presentation, but it will be good to share this among our colleagues. Yes, thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here for this uh, second portion of uh, today's events as well. And I agree with my esteemed colleague that uh, people, the hiring, the retention, uh, the training is going to continue to be an issue. Um, it's very challenging to find individuals with the backgrounds that we need. Uh, and often when you train them to get the skills that they require, uh, they often uh, will leave <laughs> after to uh, different opportunities. Uh, so one of the things that I think we're going to see embraced at a greater uh, rate are services to augment existing security teams. So expertise in fields like incident response and red teaming, uh, threat intelligence, uh, and other variables, not to replace, but to augment existing teams simply so they can scale. Um, the second thing that I think is facing uh, security leaders uh, going forward is the security formula is broken. The amount of time and effort and money that we're putting into cybersecurity doesn't necessarily result in effectiveness. We keep on buying new solutions and services and things of this nature, but we don't really take the time in many cases to optimize and ensure that we're actually getting a return on investment. That if we spend a million dollars on a firewall, we're getting at least a million dollars worth of value on this firewall. So I think moving from an assumption-based model where we're just following best practices, doing patch management, vulnerability scanning, and so on, we're actually measuring the effectiveness of our security tools to make sure they're actually doing what we're supposed to, they're supposed to be doing. And the final point is, I think threat intelligence is going to play an increasingly important role. Um, many times, it's too much information for most organizations to handle. Very few organizations have a large threat intelligence group. Oftentimes, it's the cybersecurity team, and they put on a second hat, and that hat is threat intel. So they might not have a background and expertise in that, which is another area where I think um, outsourcing threat intelligence might become important. But I think we're going to see threat intelligence as a tip of the spear 
for a threat intelligence-led approach where you're going to be testing IOCs and TTPs from the latest threat intel within your organization so it's been personalized and operationalized so you know for a fact if based on this latest threat intel, if an attack comes in, an APT, some type of ransomware, and so on, how will my endpoint, my network, my email, my cloud security tools respond? And I think those are three of the uh, hot items for the future. Thanks, Brian, uh, for your insights. Uh, let's hear what Dr. Erdal has to say about this. Everything was said, uh, but my biggest challenge today was uh, connecting, uh, catching a connecting flight. I'm in the airport, so apologies <laughs> for being casual and for loud. As a CISO, uh, I came here to visit some customers. Okay, what I see beside what Brian and Abdurrahman said is the skill shortage is not just in the talent side, but sometimes I see it in the CISO side as well. Some mm -hmm. of the CISOs, they come just on the business side. They are great leaders, but they don't understand the cybersecurity landscape, as Brian said, and sometimes they can uh, wrongly invest million dollars on something else, which is not going to really help the right the right solutions. The second thing is, I see, again, I'm talking as advisor more than a CISO now, uh, getting the right vendors. Sometimes we just go to the vendor because of its name without checking if it fits our needs or not. Like, if you need a shoe, you don't just go to Nike, for example, or to Adidas and just uh, get any shoe you like. It's a good idea to test it out, even though you know your shoe size is, for example, number 10. You still test it out because the cut can, can change uh, sometimes between shoe sizes. Same things apply to cybersecurity. I mean, when you buy a cheap car, you do a test drive, especially when you buy secondhand, right? You go and test it out. You Before you spend $5,000 or 10,000 reals, you know, I just make the numbers up, you test it out. So why not do a proper POC with your uh, current partners? Why? We saw this year. Um, unfortunately, no matter how much we invest, no matter how much uh, uh, vendors invest on security, hackers still finding ways to go through. Which brings me to my third point is being in an even greater community. Yes, threat intel, as Brian said, is the most important thing. Red teaming is as much as important because this, you know, knowing yourself is going to help you to know, you know, if you know yourself, you know your weaknesses. If you know your technology, you, you are a bit stronger. But if you know your technology together with your threat actors, I mean, if in a financial industry, there is some certain threat actors, if you don't follow them, you are already, doesn't matter what technology you use, I think you are a step behind. Uh, when I see the panel, I, you know, in my previous life when I was at Microsoft, I, I worked with some of you and I'm proud to say that I always try to be honest regardless which vendor I represent because this industry is small and if we don't tell the truth for, uh, for short incomes or short foreseeing, we're not going to move forward. What I'm trying to say is building a strong community is important. Threat intel within the community, sharing our experiences with events like that is also important. Well, and this is probably also a challenge because sometimes I don't feel that we give everything that we're supposed to give. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Adal. These are very valid points. Uh, we'll come to Dr. Reem. Uh, Mashallah, she has been playing multiple roles in Kuwait Oil Company. And we would like to ask uh, Dr. Reem about what challenges she faced as a CISO and also from her new role today as a digital transformation officer. Also, it will be good if you say how does it differ. Excellent. First, I would like to thank you, Adif and uh, Mr. Ahmed and all the B-side Jidda team. It's really great to contribute in the community of Saudi and Jidda. And it's great to see my colleagues here, Dr. Erdal, Abdurrahman, and Nimri, and Mr. Brian. It's really great to see you. We will always communicate through uh, virtual, so it's wonderful to see now virtual with uh, faces alive. So uh, to reflect on the challenges, I would echo all my uh, colleagues here what they have said and when we say top three challenges then i'm gonna just echo these stuff but if we say what are the challenges we will add up to what has been shared here is that we need to build that trust 
circle, as uh, Dr. Erdal said, among our community. And uh, one of the challenges here uh, being seen that these adversaries uh, have their own forum where they trust each other and they share the knowledge, they share the, let's say, vulnerabilities, whether yeah, any, for any reasons, whether it was uh, uh, financial reasons or financial gains, etc. but they do trust each other and they uh, do have that alignment of knowing uh, each other's and getting each other's back. Uh, what we have been trying in the very past years, and alhamdulillah we've been successful in doing that, is that we uh, have been trying to create these circles of trust within the energy sector, within the region, within, uh, within inside Kuwait, and even at global uh, level. And we have succeeded in doing that through several initiatives. Uh, I remember Dr. Erda, when I first see him, saw him, uh, was in uh, a place where he has been very much transparent. Uh, and uh, I can say that I told him that at that time that he gained my trust because we can sense people when they are being transparent and when they are being, you know, uh, on putting the hat of their companies. But Dr. Erdal was a CISO, giving the trust by being genuine and by being transparent, and he's putting himself in the CISO's shoes. So he was putting himself in my shoes and was being very much transparent. Such transparency, such trust will always enable us to be able to look at the others, you know, at what is next and to mature together. So uh, in addition to all my colleagues have said, I would say that uh, another challenge is really to collaborate more uh, thoroughly, more uh, in, in a governance and uh, let's say organized way uh, without the hesitation that we can see even within our Middle East culture because there is always hesitation from being blamed, from being finger pointed. And that's something that we need uh, always to um, to tackle. And there are ways that we have succeeded in doing that, but maybe we'll keep it inshallah during the panel session and not waste the whole session on the first day and the first question. Back to you, Atif. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Rahim. So let us move ahead to our next point of discussion, which is something uh, I, uh, Brian already gave a topic. So I will skip Brian for this and let's see here what the guys have to say. Uh, let's see what uh, Engineer Abdurrahman has to say about this. How do you convince the board? How do you ensure you get an adequate uh, amount, you know, to run the show? Uh, Engineer Abdurrahman, please uh, enlighten us. Yes, yes, Adel, thank you very much. Actually, I use different tools to convince the board. Number one, try to tie everything to risk. Talk the language they understand. Put numbers on the table. Uh, put uh, something they understand it. The, the, the next tool that I usually use, which is I think is very effective one, is the compliance and regulation requirements. I use it to push for my cybersecurity program. Guys, we are very lucky that we have co compliance and regulation requirements. I mean, let us take Saudi Arabia, for example. If we compare pre-2017 and after 2017, we have a very big, huge difference. We have a very, I mean, in three years, we, we achieved a lot in the field of cybersecurity. And the reason behind that is the establishment of the National Cyber Security Agency in Saudi Arabia with a reporting line directly to the Royal Court. They came up with the NCA, NCA regulation, and uh, this helps every organization out here to, 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 to put some of their investment in, in cybersecurity. Uh, another tool that I usually use is the uh, use example from international threat landscape. I always use Equifax as an example uh, to promote the batch management process. I mean the Equifax uh, data breach and then uh, using insider threat, for example, to motivate for uh, the concept of zero trust implementation. Another tool is to compare your or organization security posture to, with, with another uh, organization in the same industry. Uh, compare yourself, uh, I, I used to put a presentation and I used the NIST five core functions and I drew uh, the current posture with the requirement and uh, try to, to, to point out the gap in between as a tool to convince the board that we need more fund, we need more interest in cybersecurity. Thank you. Okay, great. This is a uh, uh, great uh, input from your end. Let's hear what Dr. Ayla has to say on this. 
honestly, uh, I agree with what Abdurrahman said, but I think Brian did a great job. Uh, the numbers are right in front of us. Uh, to make it much easier, all what you have to do is get the latest newspaper, look at the technology, and sometimes you don't have to even look at the technology section, look at the impact. For example, that six hours Facebook down, it was not a cyber incident, at least we don't have an incident, but what happened to the share price? Just imagine it was a cyber incident. What was going to be the share price drop? Uh, or as, again, dear Dr. Abdurrahman said, you know, uh, bring numbers. Of course, we have to tie everything to business. Today, a CISO is a translator. I mean, uh, Dr. Reem said it. When I first met Dr. Reem, uh, you know, I, I had to be honest because it's like, if you don't tell the truth, I mean, smart woman, mashallah, you know, everybody knows her now, but back then I didn't know her. I was honestly to another event in Kuwait. They dropped me there. But being honest, being transparent, and talking emotional, is this not, forget about cybersecurity. How can you be good friends with me? The same should apply to board as well. If the board knows that you don't want to really make any vendor just rich, saying that now I'm working for a vendor, all right? Uh, now I'm vendor myself. But I always put myself in the other side shoe. If I'm not going to be helped, look, I was at Microsoft. Then I moved to bank, standard chartered. Now with, I'm, I'm with Komodo. Uh, I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow. Honestly, I left with good conditions, but we have to know that the world is much smaller than we think. Example, three weeks ago, I was in Australia. Uh, yesterday, I was in New York. Today, I am here. In two weeks, I'm going to be in uh, Saudi. And in four weeks, I'm going to be in Dubai. And this is COVID. So if I keep lying, I can only jump, jump once, twice, three times. Same applies to the board. If I can, if, if I make, if I somehow convince them to make the wrong investment, if I cannot translate what the business needs, it's going to come and bite me back. Convincing, honestly, thanks to hackers and sarcastically, I don't have to do much to convince them anymore. These days, most of the C suit people are calling me. I'm like, Erdal, what can we do? Look, can you please come and help us to ensure that uh, this is not going to affect us? I mean, now being in a, in a cybersecurity company myself, like Brian, we work with very smart people. They understand cybersecurity. And uh, of course, we have smart customers as well. But just a few months back when I was in the bank, I used to get uh, from country CEOs or product CEOs calls that, hey, do you think this will affect us? I'm like, how did you know about it? Ah, this was in the news. So uh, today, uh, convincing is a bit easier, but convincing to, do, to make them the right decision is all depending on our skill set. And this ties on our soft skills. I, I always make fun of my own English. Born in Germany, Turkish parents, living in Australia, Dubai. I can't even have a no accent, but doesn't matter what I say. At the end, uh, the message is always clear. We either do the right thing or assume breach. The hackers, you know, one incident is much more, a uh, thousand times more effective uh, than advices. As Abdurrahman said, uh, do you remember the Aramco incident, which changed the Saudi history? Why? Because after that, cybersecurity started to be more and more uh, important. And um, they, um, today, Aramco, I know, I was there a few, few uh, two years ago at least, uh, they are world-class security. Why? Because they learn from the incident. And I hope most of our customers are not going to learn from the incidents. They're going to work with the right partners. They fit the needs and be more secure. Yeah, true. Thank you, Dr. Adar, for this wonderful insight. Uh, if you allow me, Atif, um, I would uh, like... Uh, yeah, this Please. is Fatma Turkestani, yes. Uh, yeah. I'd like to uh, first to uh, welcome everyone here. Now, I'd like to add to, to what has been discussed is to try to link your cybersecurity strategy with the corporate strategy. Try to find how your strategy will achieve the, the, the objectives of the corporate strategy. Here is a key. If you can find this link, I think you can uh, express your cybersecurity importance to the board and uh, show your progress in uh, uh, accordance to this uh, achieve in achieving this uh, objectives 
uh, one more thing is uh, speak less technical and more business. And I know this is a challenge uh, for us as uh, cybersecurity, uh, as, as a technical people in general, and cybersecurity. But, but trust me, when you, you know, yesterday I was attending the FII, and some of the session was um, totally talking about invest, uh, invest, investment. I'm not, I'm not the one who's uh, yeah, knowing more about investments. Uh, so th- those sessions uh, that was targeted the, um, the, the people who's working in investment, in, in investment field, it was like, um, um, I don't know, like uh, something, uh, a black box for me. I couldn't understand anything uh, what they are talking about. And I remember that when we are t- talking uh, technical language, it, was, it is the same for the board. They didn't understand what we are talking about. Uh, they didn't realize what is the importance of cybersecurity. So what the attacks, so what the, um, uh, the, the security controls, uh, you know, all that they care about um, risks, the money, the money, the reputation of the company. So we can, um, w- when we talk less technical and more business, I think we had the, their uh, uh, their points and uh, yani find a way um, middle half between between each each of uh, us. And if if I could add just a little something to that as well, I I, I know I, I just spoke on a half hour about a similar subject, but one little one little thing I, I would like to say is that uh, again we we've been asking to have security have a seat at the board forever, and and now we do now people understand it's it's critical and it has to, we have to have that conversation. But that's a double-edged sword because now we need to be able to, as my colleague said, speak at a business level, speak much more strategically, build those relationships with these individuals that aren't security people or necessarily technical people. So those soft side skills, understand the overall business and the business processes as a whole. And that's something that sometimes security uh, leaders don't have just as a function of the amount of time they need to spend doing security related items. I always suggest to uh, new CISOs to spend time with the head of sales, the head of finance, the head of operations to get an understanding of how do they present to the board? Because there's a very specific speak. There's a very specific flow. There's numbers augmented by um, emotion and, and, you know, perspectives that they're looking for. And that's what they need. So learn from your peers in non-technical, non-security areas as well, because the CFO has been presenting to the board far longer than the CISO as a, as a business as a whole. Um, so there's a lot that can be gleaned from those. So it might be one area to uh, learn and sort of expand your mindset in terms of how information is presented. Uh, great, uh, Brian. Uh, Dr. Reem, uh, would you like to add something on this? Yeah, uh, I believe my colleagues have shed many lights, but let me share it from my current role. Um, so uh, when uh, Dr. Dal mentioned that uh, the CISO needs to look at from the business perspective, now leading a digital transformation in my company, with that CISO mindset, uh, has enabled me to become the partner of the business. However, I, I also ally very closely with my uh, cybersecurity, let's say, team, and uh, I'm becoming the biggest ally here. So what we're doing here now is that one of the main challenges, if you go to the, to the first question, was that information security or cybersecurity was always being involved at the very late stages in many cases. And that's why we're being seen uh, as showstoppers or delayers, et cetera. So with my current role and becoming a business leader here, leading this transformation, I have ensured, because I know that we have been suffering that from that when I was on the cybersecurity side, and to, I, was, I have ensured to involve our information security at the zero stage, as we call it. Uh, and with that, we are weaving the whole digital transformation journey with the cybersecurity being uh, there and, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, design phase. And that will really reflect to the board by itself. Uh, like uh, also Brian said and Fatma, and you know, when we look at the board, we should not at all talk yeah, and technical. We should avoid all of our terms, um, and uh, we should talk to them uh, in Google in a business language. One comment was on Dr. 
Erdal and I have dislike Yani. I believe uh, everyone keeps saying hackers. We know that uh, there are ethical hackers and there are cyber criminal hackers. And I have many friends of Yani uh, Gul ethical hackers. So when we always say hackers, hackers, I feel very much offended because I have many ethical hackers that really saved us at many, uh, yani many places and they are researchers. So when you talk about the cyber criminals, hack, uh, Angola, uh, the adversaries or attackers, uh, these boards need to monetize the risk. So when you go to the board, don't talk to him about the vulnerability, don't talk to him about, well, I have this batch management and I have this number of vulnerabilities, this, these are missing the batch, etc. He doesn't understand that language, like um, like Ryan said. CFO comes with dashboards that really monetize the return on value, return on investment, the revenue, and all of that. So monetize the risk. What happens if that asset gets compromised? What happens if that safety management system gets penetrated? Uh, it will affect HSE, health, safety, and uh, environment. It will impact or do a production interruption and pass loss in millions and all of that. Here only, you'll, you will trigger their attention and they will try uh, they will listen to you more actively and when they do that as Erdo said we need to be very transparent and we need to make become very loyal as their any good advisors and not overcome uh, or let's say abuse the current uh, you know uh, increase uh, in the uh, adversaries attack and all of that we need to become very much uh, let's say uh, transparent and let the facts uh, talk by themselves in a way that where we monetize the risk. This is the main thing I want to be sharing here, that we need not to talk at the risk of information security. Information security risk over from a business perspective's risk and reflecting the impact of that on financial terms. That's it, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Uh, let's move to the next point, which is again uh, somewhat related to the skill set of a CISO. We are now clear from the first and the second point that CISO should talk a business language but how technical he should be. This is also another discussion going on. So uh, let's see what Brian has to say on this. Sure. Uh, a trend that I'm seeing, and I, I started seeing this primarily with pharmaceutical companies maybe four years ago, maybe, f maybe f even five years ago, but situations where the CIO is now reporting into the CISO. And that's because the CISO is being seen as such a business strategic role. And the role of the CIO sometimes is being seen as a diminishing role with the adoption of the cloud and bring your own device, various apps, uh, the ability for organizations to turn up services and things like that. Um, it's, it seems to be contracting in, in some regard while the CISO's role seems to be expanding. In fact, I was working with a pharmaceutical company where the CIO promoted herself to CISO and hired a CIO under her. And I've now seen this happen a few times. So at the po that point, I thought that was an isolated event, but I'm seeing it referenced more and more. As it ties back into this question, um, just like board members don't necessarily need to be technical or security experts, and in most cases, they are not those things, uh, CISOs, while they don't need to be highly technical, they do have to have a level of technical and security understanding, I think, to be successful. I don't think they can just be a general business leader. It's like saying, does the CFO need to understand how to read a spreadsheet and the basics of economics? I would, I would hope they would. And I would hope that a CISO has at least the fundamental idea of you know, general networking and, and, and what these threats are and, and at least what the terms and processes, uh, re requirements and certifications and things like that all can be. However, I don't necessarily think they need to come up from formerly being reverse engineers or experts on the red team or anything of that nature. Um, I think historically, we've seen that. We've seen people that have kind of come out from system and network administration into security, maybe on the Intel side, red team, blue teaming, purple teaming, and then they become a director, VP, and then eventually a CISO. And that's fine too. As long as along that track, they're picking up some of those soft side skills, some of those business skills that are absolutely necessary. But I'm also seeing now people coming up from different tracks, maybe within the organization, operational roles where then they move into a CISO role. And in doing so, they have to learn or gain some of that experience. And it's not that dissimilar to, I've, I've done a lot of startups in, in, my, in my background. Uh, 
oftentimes you'll see a CEO that will get an executive MBA uh, from Berkeley or Harvard or MIT or some organization where they're they're sort of doing it at nights and weekends and they're 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 building up that pedigree so they have that stronger business context because they might have been a, a technical individual or, or a salesperson and now all of a sudden they're a CEO. So I don't think they need to be the most technical person in the organization. They can certainly hire for that and they can have some direct reports that fulfill that role. But I absolutely do think that they abs- they need to have the basics. Because if they don't have that, I do not think that they can be effective in their role. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, let's see what Abdul Rahman has to say. Mashallah, he is uh, an uh, expert, and we had a very wonderful session with him uh, today morning on reverse engineering. Uh, and now uh, he's CISO. Uh, yes, Abdul Rahman, please. Yes, thank you, Atif. Uh, as Brian said, I think that the CISO needs to have a basic knowledge of in the cybersecurity field. He needs to understand the basics of at least everything. So uh, the terms, the terminology used. Uh, I came from a very extensive technical background, and I make a very good use of it. Sometimes it could be a bad thing to be very technical, in, in the case that you don't have any management skills, we say that a CISO should, have the, should understand the basic cybersecurity. At the same time, he should be very strong on the management side. He should master the communication and presentation skills. CISO will talk to different types of audiences. He will talk to the executive management, to the business unit managers, to end users, to IT, to security team, third parties. Each one of these audience needs a special language to talk with in order for the CISO to enable the security throughout the enterprise. Uh, Another thing about the CISO should understand is like, for example, cybersecurity policy development, incident management, risk assessment and uh, management. And as uh, uh, my colleague said that uh, a CISO should uh, talk less technical and more management. And and that's the key, I think. Thank you. True. Thanks, uh, Engineer Abdurrahman. This is uh, one of the uh, CISO survey which talks about you know the skill set and uh, technical expertise being rated and also there is something about business knowledge what uh, we all agree here so also to have a relationship with other business units and yeah. when it comes to cyber security technical expertise uh, 12 percent people consider it as you know the most important task. so this is something uh, I believe all of us believe in Atif, can I comment on that slide? And sure, yeah, please, remember, yes. please, please. Yes. So let me reflect on, on the personal experience here and personal story. So my background is computer engineering, um, and then I did my master in business administration, then the PhD in operation management. So, uh, and career-wise, I started with the IT networking, then went to, uh, you know, all various types of information and IT projects, uh, management and all of that. And then uh, ended up with the digital uh, assets and leading the digital transformation, the assets of Kuwait oil fields. And well, when we started doing that, we uh, digitalizing the assets, we thought that we can't digitalize the assets without really securing them. Because when we talk about OT environment, the risk becomes very, very much higher, where the cybersecurity starts having that physical arm of impacting people's lives and safety. So without even be, before even being a CISO or in, under the information security, we had that internal sense uh, as digital transformation, uh, let's say, officers that we need to secure what we're doing. However, uh, when I went and uh, you know, uh, promoted to a CISO role, all of this IT background and that technical knowledge in networking and, uh, let's say, uh, uh, corporate solutions, uh, SCAD and OT, it really helped me in understanding the risks challenging those vendors, uh, knowing how these roadmaps will really be impactful, uh, and also trying, uh, when we, uh, you know that in information security, you have different sections of teams under your, uh, under your leadership at the CISO, and many of them have very technical backgrounds. So you need to challenge your team, you need to get the best out of them, and if you cannot talk their language in many aspects, uh, you will lose them. 
So uh, a technical understanding is a must. I really don't believe that uh, leaders should only be a great leaders and they, they can you know, skip the technical background. No, this is a must. However, the soft skills for a CISO specifically is very crucial. Uh, when uh, Dr. I believe uh, when Mr. Brian has mentioned that many CEOs has went to Harvard, Berkeley and uh, many uh, other institutes, uh, my company has uh, enrolled me in the Harvard executive program. And I can say that after graduating from that program, my mindset as a CISO has shifted into a more mature understanding the business uh, you know, uh, owners and became more you know, proactive towards and being a business enabler rather than being a cybersecurity defender. So uh, after that graduation, uh, I have started to put these two hats of business enabler and a cyber defender. And that only came after knowing the business understanding the knowledge and starting to listen actively to these people and also react and you know being empathetic and uh, giving uh, building those, those trust and having these communication skills where we have that trust in, and they trust in us that we are here as their bodyguards and securing their projects of millions of dinners or dollars uh, and they start you know approaching us without me we uh, playing the auditor there they start to approach us as their advisors in order to ensure that their vendors who are leading these, let's say, a million or billion uh, worth uh, projects are doing the rightful security implementation and mit mitigations toward the risk themselves. That will only happen when you have that business skills and you have that soft skills with the business user. Again, the same soft skills is needed, and I will wrap up with this one, for the CISO uh, to have it with his, his own people. Because we are in cybersecurity, we get lots of burnout. So the CISO should be technical, yes, but he should be also a human leader, empathetic leader. And he should be touching always base with his own people. Because if he ignores that human aspect, then there will be high turnover uh, and uh, you know, high, high turnover because there will be many burnouts and many of the, his team will be exhausted and, uh, let's say, uh, uh, and you find a, 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 a the soonest opportunity just to leave the team or go to another IT field. Uh, and that's the, really the experience that I wanted to share with you here. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about another talk of the town virtual CISO, which has been, uh, I believe, mostly, uh, let's when it talk, uh, talk about Middle East, there are larger organization, we see the security leaders already running uh, the show and doing their job, uh, but maybe from a, a small or a medium uh, scale uh, organization, virtual CISO may be an option. Uh, Brian can enlighten in on this uh, and share his input. Uh, your mic is mute, Brian. Still mute. Brian, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Now, yes, yes. we can. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm probably the least... Unless you uh, were talking virtually and encrypted so we couldn't hear you. <laughs> that's right. That, and there's the problem. <laughs> uh, out, out of this panel, I, I certainly can't speak to the Middle East specifically um, yeah. in terms of, of the specific issues and um, that, that might be there. But I, I can say, yes, we've... <sighs> This, this has kind of come in and out of style over time. Um, I remember when salesforce.com first started, and I, I live in, in Silicon Valley, so that's I, I got to kind of see it from ground zero as it happened. And sort of ha instead of having a, a big, heavy-duty on-prem CRM system, people started using this. And there was a little bit of hesitancy at the very beginning, but then it just took off. Um, the virtual CISO idea uh kind of came in and we thought maybe that same thing would happen and then it kind of fell out of favor so i i would just say this i think for uh government organizations i think for large organizations fortune 500 global 2000 etc i think it would be pretty challenging um i think for small to mid-sized organizations, I think even having shared CISOs in some of those cases where one CISO helps 
consult, provide value across multiple small or small to medium sized companies can make a lot of sense. Um, but you do have to have at least one person in the organization that kind of owns that relationship with that virtual CISO. So they're acting as an apprentice, if you will, uh, a direct conduit, as opposed to that person just answering to a committee. Uh, because if you do it through committee, then you lose a sense of responsibility. And then I think it actually becomes more of a hindrance than a help. So large organizations, probably not. Small organizations, I think it makes sense. And even a shared virtual CISO type model, I think is something that could fly if it's managed properly for those small organizations. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Dr. Reda, uh, you have spent a number of years in the Middle East and you know the market here very well. So it will be good to have your input on this. Specifically in the Middle East, I think we see so, if we rename we see so CISO advisor, it will be perfectly fine. Why? Every CISO, including myself, yes, look, every time I, I, you know, I got PhD, I wrote books, I spoke in all these conferences, I worked in all these companies, but when I speak to Dr. Reem or to Brian or to Dr. Herman, I'm like, wow, they're even smarter people than me. So cybersecurity is like going to China. Uh, and in China, you know, when you buy something, you negotiate and you think you get the best price until you meet someone else who has better price than you. That's same in cybersecurity. What I'm trying to say is there is going to be always smarter people than you, but a CISO is the key for extremely confidential information. Uh, and as Brian said, fortune companies with virtual CISO, especially in Middle East, especially in Middle East will should not happen because you know middle east since the beginning of humanity i don't know if you notice like uh, most of four big religions were born there uh based on quran we had more than uh, you know thousands of uh, prophets were sent there the four big books were sent there and even today right now there is some political issues i mean if you fly for example from dubai 100 miles up you're in syria there is a war or from Saudi Arabia you go a little bit down Yemen there is a war and you know all these political issues yes they're going to be there because it was there for 2000 years I hope it's going to be less going forward but a CISO again has should be you know should not knows or has the ability to see the most comfort information stuff that's why if we rename virtual, virtual CISO to CISO advisors yeah there's going to be smarter people than you. They should come and advise you. But, as in, but again, as Brian said, having no CISO versus having someone who is overseeing you with someone locally in charge is the only option. Uh, I see all these talks, oh, virtual CISO is going to be virtual. Unfortunately, no, not like Salesforce. That's my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But... Salesforce, uh, I'm pretty sure Brian saw it as well. It was clear because back then all the CRMs on-prem had lots of issues. Um, but Salesforce came in a, such a time that they made things much, much easier. Um, but how can a virtual CISO come do, for example, uh, regulations, ISO regulations? You know, when you do ISO 27001, you do it based on a scope, and that scope is based on a location and based on the people on that location. And uh, who's over going to see that? CISO. If the CISO is virtual, how he or she is going to oversee that? Question mark. Of course, you can find ways you can make that person work. Look there, but you know, I don't think so. We are ready there yet, and I don't think so. We are there yet, but I don't know what the others think. Yeah, I believe this is a very valid point, especially sharing the confidential information from one place to another. Uh, this can be a threat to the organization. So instead of gaining the experience, uh, it can become you know another cyber threat. So yeah, this does make sense. Uh, let's move to the another question, which is about managing the widening cybersecurity skills gap in the market. I would like to have Dr. Fatima to uh, please uh, share her inputs on this. Yes, uh, the, uh, as uh, Abdurrahman uh, said before, that the skills uh, gap is really one of the top concern for CISO. And uh, what uh, gets this worst is the cyber security gap is, um, uh, this gap is uh, getting more, uh, getting to get more uh, bigger or it increased. Um, 
other another challenge is that uh, we need someone who's uh, working in cybersecurity and intersect with other uh, uh, domains such as, for example, artificial intelligence or uh, IoT uh, or telecommunication. So we need an expert within uh, within uh, who, who 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 have the knowledge in these uh, two different uh, fields together. So he could, for example, uh, secure the IoT systems or secure, for example, the cloud or security communication and so on. I think uh, in order to get uh, over this challenge is uh, to invest in your people, uh, try to develop them, uh, upskilling them uh, through training, uh, sometimes through rotations, um, coaching and mentoring is also a good uh, tool we can use as a CSIS. In addition to, um, for example, some organizations uh, you know, were not uh, investing too much in people and training, so CSIS here could, for example, go to um, get, their, get their team more engaged uh, motivate them uh, to be self-learn or develop themselves. Uh, yeah, and now it's not like before. There is a lot of um, conferences online, which is free of charge. Uh, there is a lot of uh, online courses and different e-learning platforms, so they can uh, yeah, and take the responsibility to develop themselves. They just maybe need the motivation and the engagement. Uh, as well as the role of universities here, yeah, universities and uh, have a good role to prepare the good candidates for to be fit in the marketplace. And uh, partnership between universities and the private sector will attract more talent to the cybersecurity and help to bridge this gap. Uh, another panelist, I think, mentioned a very good point is about uh, developing the knowledge for the CISO himself or herself. So I think CISOs need to be up to date. Um, I know yeah, CISOs schedule is busy all the time. However, uh, he must uh, have like a, a regular time for uh, developing himself and his capabilities uh, rather than getting courses or training or get uh, yeah, uh, on job training. Uh, or other uh, another mean. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Fadima. Uh, Dr. Reem, would you like to add uh, something on this? Yes, sure. Uh, I would also echo what Dr. Fadima has mentioned and add to that that uh, in order for us to address the skills gap, uh, the, my background might relate uh, to what I'm talking about. Uh, we, uh, I'm a co-founder of Women Cybersecurity Middle East Group, where we have more than uh, almost now uh, 2,000 uh, you know, members. And we highly believe, uh, not only from the Wixme leadership, I'm also leading the diversity and inclusion uh, gender PMO in the oil sector. Uh, where uh, we really highly believe that women can always address such shortages and, and gaps and, and, and the IT, in the STEM, as well as the cyber security, which is a more challenging uh, shortage in, in the market itself. So by also attracting more women, empowering more women in cybersecurity, we can for surely address and minimize, not for surely any, uh, delete or uh, close that gap. However, we can highly impact that. And we have been doing that through our Wixme uh, group where we have been, uh, as Fatma has said, uh, mentoring the ladies, uh, building or uh, showing uh, their success, uh, building their uh, soft skills as well, uh, doing the knowledge session and all of that. So uh, skill gaps can be addressed by, uh, let's say, empowering women in cybersecurity, attracting more, uh, short, uh, attracting more skills in that aspect. Uh, and since I have mentioned Wixme, uh, I believe also Ms. Uh, Samir Inizi has also shared in the earlier session and presented that. And uh, she's another Wixme member. So uh, we can see that the three of the women that is participating besides uh, Jidda event are uh, all from Wixme. And this can also address that we as a gender, uh, let's say diversity, will always help in uh, making a more productive and will impact into our cybersecurity community uh, and address that skills. In addition to that, we need also to build and invest in our uh, younger generations. So uh, what? how can we do that? 
let's not just address the uh, you know high schools and the graduates from the university noting that we need always to work very closely with the academia in building the curriculums of cybersecurity. I'm so happy that now in our Middle East region, we have started seeing uh, universities, uh, you know, having these curriculums of cybersecurity at the bachelor degree, at the master degree, but let's go much lower. Uh, I have been contributing in programs where uh, cybersecurity is being introduced from K1 to up to K12. So uh, class one up to class 12, they start introducing to them, uh, and especially the girls, what uh, are cybersecurity? Look at these role models from all over the globe. Uh, and I have participated that uh, in CyberHair uh, with the Colorado uh, University and also did the same with the BP uh, initiative in UK. And the impact was huge because uh, these young generations and these young potentials, if you start putting that seed of cybersecurity and let them be curious about it and let them know that you can be a cyber defender, you can help us in securing the whole universe. You can become our superhero uh, in securing all of these digital platforms. They start having that seed within them and they start exploring. And you don't have to do any investment or any, you know, any efforts because all they need is just their iPads, their small mobiles, and they will do magic. So all what they need is just to put that seed tell them that there is cybersecurity and just share with them some success stories with it was from role models of women or men and tell them how impactful they can be, especially that they are very much impacted with Marvel heroes and all of that superheroes. Being in cybersecurity, we can play that superhero and we can always secure our societies that is now currently living the new digital era. So tapping at these areas can ho hopefully uh, highly impact in solving and shortening the skills gap. Thank you, Abdul. Out of your muted, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Aha, uh -huh. not just Brian. Now they they're talking secretly without us. It's, it's... <laughs> He's encrypting. He's encrypting. <laughs> okay, I was saying we are already ahead of our time, and we crossed eight minutes. So we will just see some of the important questions. Uh, the one is about the reporting structure for the CISO. So, Dr. Dal, if you can briefly and quickly say what uh, can be, you know, the reporting structure in the coming days. Brian already mentioned this a little bit earlier. Honestly, I saw now CIOs reporting the CISOs as well. Uh, and first, I was very surprised because, uh, you know, CIO was a title to have years ago. But uh, seeing the shift uh, for, for the reasons which Brian explained, I think makes sense. Uh, based on Gartner's. I mean, in a bank, uh, it's said chartered, standard chartered. I was reporting to the regional COO. Uh, it was different. It, I was part of business channel, and we were overseeing what the CIO was doing. Uh, and God, based on God, not is normal. If you ask me, should a CISO should report to CIO? My answer will be no, because CIO has an agenda, an agenda of making things, getting published, as soon as possible. For example, applications. Uh, CIO has to ensure that he or she is aligned with the business and that applications release as soon as possible. We all know, even today, security is still not built from ground. It's always added later. <laughs> Having a CISO not being in the same reporting chain is going to ensure that security has been enforced because the CIO or CIO group is going to know that, hopefully, the CEO is going to pick up on those issues. Uh, and maybe there is going to be delay. Uh, if their work is up here, that's the best. But uh, reporting line, uh, I am lucky. I report straight to the board, straight to the CEO in my current role. As I said, this is also great because I have access to the CEO one-to-one -one anytime. And uh, in the bank, I was also talking to the CEOs, but there was always like, uh, maybe someone is listening to me now, but it's like, Political, like, why are you all passing me going straight to the CEO? Don't you trust me? Uh, especially when the CEO is not technical enough. Uh, there could be some political issues. My best, and I enjoy my role at the moment, I report, as I said, directly. Where possible, this is great. But uh, we're not possible, having CIOs and CEOs as a peer, we're inside by side, uh, is the best option, if you ask me. I mean, 
CEO should report to the CEO or to the board. If not, definitely not to the CEO. Uh, definitely not to the uh, CIO. That's my opinion. Uh, great. Thanks, Dr. Nadal. Uh, Sorry, being in the airport. <laughs> no problem. So this is the last question, and we would like to hear from uh, uh, Engineer Abdul Rahman to, you know, enlighten on this. We, and maybe we you imagine yourself being in a situation where you, one of the most critical, you know, system is being compromised with the ransomware, and now you are, you need to decide whether you need to pay or not to pay. What do you think? We have seen uh, even the government, the current discussion being going on, uh, even banning the companies, uh, you know, for doing the ransomware payments. So, Engineer Abdul Rahman, can you please? Okay. Uh, Thank you, Atif. Uh, actually, first, let us uh, do our best not to be infected with ransomware. Let us take every measure we can. Training, awareness, verified backup systems, strict access controls, all these will help. Uh, I was reading about this subject. Uh, I was once in a conference and I asked this question to uh, a very well-known in the cybersecurity field. Actually, I forget the name. He wrote a book about this subject. And he, I told him, should we pay or not pay a ransomware in case we have to? He said, if, if it's the only option, then you pay and pray. Pay and pray. It means that if you pay, you may not get your data back online. Uh, yeah. So it is not. FBI advises victims not to pay ransomware at all because there is no guarantee that the hacker will restore your system. Besides, you are telling the adversary that their business actually works. So some think it might be more cost efficient to pay the ransomware because uh, the recovery process may cost even more. So uh, in, in my own opinion, if, if uh, payment is the only option, we should not uh, deal with the attacker directly. I mean, let us put somebody in between, like an agent who will do the negotiation and do the payment. That's what I personally think. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Abdul Rahman. And the last thing... Uh, before we go, before we go, yes. something very important. Let's talk about two companies. One who paid, Garmin, for example. It was in the news. That's why I mentioned the name. They, they, they were demanded to pay $10 million. They paid $4 million. They get the data back. But as the engineer said, praying is always a good opinion. Then let's talk another company, EA Games. They didn't pay, and hackers released 750 gigabyte data of their latest games, uh, FIFA 2022 and this. So, uh, unfortunately, comes, you know, pay not to pay is, it's, it's a big challenge. Like paying, uh, as, as you said, you know what, go call Mandarin way before it, and honestly, I don't, I'm not getting any commission. Make sure they do a, a assessment before you get hacked or uh, use the right tools before you get hacked and don't don't even come to that stage instead of paying four million dollars to ransom pay one million dollar to your vendors and make your security posture up but uh, do you want to release your ips especially uh, sometimes they block and if you don't have a backup it is really uh, it's easy to fbi to say don't pay or pay uh, but again put yourself in the shoes of the business this is how you need to answer. Honestly, I wrote multiple books and some of my researches, I should say, don't pay many, many years ago. But now, don't pay is not an option anymore because uh, if you don't have a backup, and unfortunately, there are still lots of companies without that, then uh, if, if you can pay and hopefully get the data back, you know, don't forget, ransomware, the, the, the threat actors, I'm not calling them hackers anymore, Dr. Lim, uh, the threat actors, uh, uh, you know, they're in business too. If their name gets out, you pay and they don't release the key, they're going to lose business too. Uh, but again, my only recommendation is, as engineer said, do everything proactively before you hit by ransomware, uh, not after. Yeah, I would Sorry, just, I, I would I just had to add... say that. I gave two examples and I had to say that. I, I, I would just add on to that. I think everybody's really on point. I'd love to be very cavalier and say, don't pay. Um, it's kind of like a 1980s action movie. 
where one guy takes out a whole army. Um, that would be wonderful, Rumble. but that's not, that's not real. Yeah. It's like Rambo. It's not necessarily real life. About seven years ago, I was working with some very large financial institutions that made very large investments in Bitcoin for the sole purpose. If anything ever happened that they could pay and they could pay quickly, because as you know, it takes a few days for a Bitcoin transfer to happen and, and actually get the Bitcoin. So you can send it to the attackers on and on. So they actually bought and stored it just in case something would happen, which made me very interested in Bitcoin at the time about seven years ago. So I go, oh, I'll buy a bunch of this. So that worked out. But anyhow, the the whole notion of it is, yes, I, look, you might not have any choice. So it might, it might just be an academic discussion. But if it does happen or it hasn't happened yet, now is the time to take those precautions, back up your data, encrypt your data, make sure, make sure you have a plan in place to deal with it. Um, because ran ransomware clearly is going to be one of the most pervasive issues for at least the next decade, without a doubt. Since 1980s, by the way, right? It's not new. Uh, use technology which prevents ransomware. There are a few of them, like Komodo, that we promised that it doesn't happen. But uh, don't, don't take the word. Test it. Test it yourself. And then uh, saying, and this is the CISO of Komodo. I proud to say we prevent it. But don't take my word. Test it. If it doesn't, don't buy it. Great. Uh, Dr. Reen, would you like to share something? And uh, Very like quickly, to... because we're very much conscious of time. Uh, so what we have yes. seen here, we know that there are some countries that they have some regulations that can really put some fines uh, on those who pays. Uh, but I really want to reflect here that, uh, as Brian has said, we're not here at the 1980s or Rambo. Uh, Dr. Dal, you brought me back uh, very much, uh, <laughs> many years ago, and we're not uh, saying, no, we know it, so we don't get very old here. And I know that we have many uh, Generation uh, Z with us or X. So having that said, uh, I believe that we need to tap on the cyber resilience. And uh, this is a, a program that we have been working on the World Economic Forum uh, of an initi initiative for oil and gas. And I believe the same applies on electricity and many other uh, industries. So you need to be very much sure that you invest in the cyber resilience aspect and having that cyber business resilience, not only from a security aspect, but for your whole business continuity, uh, you know, uh, management, uh, plans, everything there. Uh, and even the backup, by the way, uh, the threat actors or adversaries have been able to uh, com compromise these backups and even corrupt them. So even when you do your backups, test them, do the uh, drill exercise, just make sure that these business continuity exercises are really working just in case that you need that backup. Because I know that one of the incidents happened in Saudi back in a couple of years ago that they did their homework. They had these backups. But however, these backups were, you know, uh, actually uh, had that uh, malware within it. And every time they try to restore that backup, it again uh, uh, wiped the whole data again. So. When you do the backups, try to make, to follow the best practices in having some technologies. Uh, I believe there are some golden backups uh, technologies uh, and approaches. And also tap on your business continuity management plans and investment in order for you to be resilient, not only from a cybersecurity aspect, however, from a business aspect as well. Thank you, Ad, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reem. And we would like, there is another point, but we would like to have it uh, in an email and we'll try to publish it through our social media accounts. One piece I think of the advice. whole session was advice for CISOs anyway. Uh, <laughs> they, they should just listen, uh, read the script. Uh, I, did, I don't remember any bad advice. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fatima, <laughs> uh, Abrahman, Brian, Reem, and myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for your time and your valuable uh, inputs. And we'd love to have similar kind of sessions in future as well, inshallah.